nor do you have any difficulty loving me. But when we get to the place that we think it's of our righteousness, you know, then you've got these grades where you'll fight against one another because you think you're a better person than so and so. Understand? Forgetting those things which are in the past, I press on. And boy, that's like getting a fresh drink of water on a hot day in August at 110 or something. Boy, it's, it gives you an inner bath spiritually where you, when you learn to forget about the things of the past. You carry no more animosity, no more bitterness, no more grudges at all. You haven't got any corns spiritually or physically. Nobody steps on your feet and hurts you because you have no, no, no injury. You have nothing you want to battle. You have nothing you want to fight with. That's why you forget about the things of the past because he has made you that you're now pressing on toward the mark of the high calling. And ladies and gentlemen, we haven't got any time to mess around with things of the past. Because when we start stewing about what happened yesterday, we just can't move fast enough. Remember, the athlete who's gone and travel fast has to travel light. If you're going to run the 100-yard dash with 15-pound shoes on, you'll never make it. If you're going to run the 100-yard dash, you take off most of the clothes you got on and put on the lightest pair of track shoes you can get a hold of, and boy, you run. And that's a remarkable thing. Before you run in that track, I've run some of these, so I know a little about it. You know what we do? We used to put on real heavy shoes and run the 100 yard on heavy shoes when we weren't in competition. Because then when we got in a competition, we'd put on a real light track shoe and our light trunks, and we'd run like a house of fire. Because we could run this much faster because we got rid of the weight. Boy, I think of that spiritually sometimes. Before you got saved and you knew what you had with Jesus, you were just loaded down with heavy shoes. Now, since you got rid of it all, you're light at heart, light in spirit, you're light in body. Now you can run like a great spiritual athlete, pressing toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Sure, bless your heart. You know why? Well, he says in chapter 4, Verse 1, watch this thing develop. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and my what? So stand fast in the Lord. Don't stand fast in what people say, the legalists say, or those who want to put you under this or put you under that. Stand fast in who? The Lord. And as you stand fast, you are the joy and rejoicing of my heart and those of us who have taught you the word of God. Now, I entreat thee, verse 3, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other of my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. I just wanted to call to gather this call to your attention, yoke fellow. We have a Yoke Fellow Fellowship up there at Defiance, that building, you know, that they built. A uh, uh, professor from where in Indiana? Who, who, who runs the Yoke Fellow? What? Tr Dr. Elton Trueblood from uh, Richmond? What, what's that school up there? Earlham College, right. He, f he founded a group called Yoke Fellows. The true Yoke Fellow Fellowship was founded long before this because it was founded with the coming of the new birth. When you and I are yoked together in Christ Jesus, we are yoke fellows. We're bound together. And you know what a yoke is? Well, some of you kids just got to go to the fairs or some place where they still have some of these things that they put around cow's necks or something. It's a yoke. Put it around their necks and get both cows staying close together, going the same direction. Did you ever put these on horses? I don't think they ever put yokes on horses, did they? No. Only on oxen, huh? Yoke the oxen. Well, somebody said the yoke's on you. It isn't either. But... Uh, uh, You know, when they put the yoke on these oxen, they were tied together. 
Well, people, you and I are tied together. We've got a job to do. We've got a job to carry out. And we are yoke fellows. We're bound together. And as we are of the same mind and of the same spirit, you see, this is that yoke fellow. And we move forth, pressing toward that mark with the greatness of the God's wonderful power. Look at this. Let your moderation, verse 5, your moderation, moderation is forbearance, be, no, be made known unto all man, men, for the Lord is at hand. Be careful. The word careful is the word anxious. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Don't be filled with anxiety. Why don't you have to be filled with anxiety? Because God is in you, in Christ, in you. And people, could you get any more than that? If God is in you, then why be anxious about tomorrow? Because the moment you're anxious about tomorrow, you're defeating yourself. You're, you're making yourself less. Suppose you've got a $10,000 bill coming due tomorrow, and you're all nervous about it tonight. What good will it do you? It'll get you all nervous up and do you much more harm if you got 10000 due tomorrow. It'll come tomorrow. Quit stewing about it. And if you're going to be anxious about it, you're not going to get the money to meet the need anyways because we're breaking the principle. Therefore, we're to be anxious about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Isn't that something? Just be thankful. Be thankful. You know why? Because you are more than conquerors. Therefore, no matter what the situation is, don't get overly distraught about it. Don't get filled with anxiety. Just with prayer and supplication, thank God. Just thank Him. You don't have to ask Him to meet your need. Because he's already promised he's going to do that. Therefore, all we do is what? Thank him. Thank him. That's right. Sometimes, people, I wish I could let you be in my shoes for a little while. Because sometimes the weeks roll by. We've got two or three thousand dollars worth of bills, no money to pay for them. And if you know the Werewill bloodline, that's not easy on us Werewills. <laughs> That's right. But this ministry is far bigger than the werewolves or anyone else. And when these tremendous needs come up, you know what I've done through the years? The only thing I know how to do, and that is just try to get my spiritual automobile in neutral. And finally just say, Lord, I thank you for supplying the need because you promised it, and Lord, I don't know where it's coming from, and I don't care, Lord, but I know you'll do it. And I just thank him for doing it. And class, I have learned that when I can get myself to believing God's word, it always works. But when little old VP sits around and he stews and he frets, and he wonders how he can work this so he can get this, how he can do this and get this thing all to fit together, man, I get tired, <laughs> all worn out, and then lo and behold, I get anxious, you know, all shook on the inside, and then the bills still come and still don't meet them. Isn't that wonderful? Be anxious for nothing but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Just get our spiritual automobile, so to speak, in neutral and just thank God that He's going to take care of it, for He said we were more than what? And how in the world can I be more than a conqueror and be completely in debt all the time and always under the board, so to speak. It's impossible. Therefore, I just have to learn this. That's why this is addressed to the church to correct the practical error that had crept in among the people because of the failure of the adherence to the revelation given in the book of Ephesians. That's why he said, the peace of God, not the anxiety of V.P. Werewell, but the peace of God will pass all understanding, and boy, it sure does. Somebody once says it also passes all misunderstanding, the peace of God. 
passes all misunderstanding. And this peace of God's going to keep your hearts. No maybe about it, right? He shall keep your hearts and he's going to keep your mind that your mind can't get off. You can't go insane. It's impossible. As long as we recognize what we have in Christ Jesus and walk on it. He's going to keep your heart and he's going to keep your mind. Through whom? Well, how big is Christ Jesus? He's big enough to do it, isn't he? Why, sure. Therefore, he says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, here's the key, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think, think on these what? Things. Because, people, we never rise beyond what we're able to think, right? And if I think negative, if I think legalism, if I think defeat, what am I going to be? Defeated. I'm going to be legalistic. I'm going to be under all those negatives, under all that law again, because that's what I'm what? Thinking. And he says, think on something else. Think on that which is good. Don't be anxious. But think on that which is true, that which is just, that which is lovely. Have you ever thought this about people, someone that you didn't like, start thinking about them as to what are their lovely points? What's the good in them? And before you'll know it, the very things you, you, you sort of didn't like about them has sort of taken second place and you think, well, by golly, they're not so bad after all. Right? Think. We control where we're going by our thinking. We control what we are and what we do because of our thinking. No person ever rises beyond what he's able to believe. But no person believes any bigger than what he thinks. If you think small, you'll act small. Therefore, if you think the bigness of God's Word, it's finally got to get to you. Suppose it only gets to you one-tenth. Well, bless God, that's one-tenth more than had gotten to you if you hadn't started thinking that way, right? That's why we have to think on these things.